Hello. <laughs> <laughs> so, how are you doing? What's going on? How's your day going? It's good. I, I'm a late riser, so uh, an owl. I, I suffer from eveningness. That's what they call it now. Um, it's a genetic thing. So, huh. two of the genes are adrift. And it used to be when I was diagnosed, it was 1.9% of the population had this condition. Delayed sleep phase syndrome, they called it. Now they figure that 20 to 25% of the population have it. Wow. And, so just uh, just night, uh, night owls? Yeah, and I just sleep the same amount of time. But uh, since I was 11 years old, my preference is to sleep from four in the morning till noon. So, um, which is to say this is quite early in my day. Um, yeah, that's quite funny, isn't it? Because there's, there's an unfair stigma about people who rise late. I find myself, because I'm similar to you, I, t- I tend to go to sleep and I end up working better at like three in the morning, go to sleep by four or so. And if I wake up late, even though I've had probably fewer hours or the same hours as everyone else of sleep, um, I feel embarrassed to maybe tell my girlfriend who's, who's been at work since 6 a.m. that I've just woken up because it makes me feel lazy. But you're, that's completely unfair, isn't it? Absolutely. And, and you hit the nail very much on the head. There was... Um... What what changed the numbers was the UK bio cohort, 430,000 people were questioned and 9% of them said they'd rather be going to bed later, getting up later. Mm. And I talked with a consultant about this who said, oh, this is self-reporting, you can't trust this. And I went to her and went, you're right, people are going to under-report it because it's a shameful thing. That's true. And uh, I mean, I, I said, I've had it since I was 11, I'm 66 now. Uh, it's, I've had three consultants test it. All four of my children have it. And in my life so far, only one person, when I've said, oh, I, I normally don't get up till noon, has said, poor you. <laughs> Everybody else has said, oh, so you can party. <laughs> it's like, no, <laughs> I just work late, you know. Yeah, no, I know what you mean. There's, there's something about getting up and seeing that the clock is seven o'clock or something. And I'm just like, I'm not. This isn't for me. I'm going. I need to wake up at twelve or ten sometimes. Even then, I was afraid I accidentally said twelve, and that people would go twelve. Oh, that's too you lazy. And it's the same. Yeah, bring it back to ten. <laughs> yeah, but then I meant nine. I meant nine. All right, and, and it's so yeah. ridiculous, isn't it? Because we're sleeping the same amount. What if? Was anyone else? What does anyone care about how much we sleep? It's medieval. It's medieval. <laughs> it goes all the way back. Yeah, there's there's a stick. If if I may say about your generation, people in their sixties, especially, I, I think, tend to wake earlier. It is even more of a stiff upper lip. Wake up early in the morning, get down the mines at five. I mean, not not, not that my dad was getting down the mines or whatever, but that's how I picture. Down the pension office. Get down the pension office five a.m. <laughs> oh, well, I'm pleased you um, woke up for for this. Um, now four hours ago. I'm in Germany. I'm an hour later than you. Uh, so it's now yeah f- five o'clock here. So I want to ask you: You are charged with being a dishonest deprogrammer and unsavory hate blogger who has spread lies about the Scientology religion. How do you plead? Uh, let's say that word by by <laughs> word. Uh, dishonest? Yeah. No. Uh, deprogrammer? No. I, I don't believe you can program people. There's a, there's a fundamental way of, of of going after people if if you don't like them. It's called an ad hominem attack where instead of dealing with the evidence that they present, you attack the person. Um, I, because I was challenged, and I, I know this is childish, but I did it anyway. Because I was challenged, um, Professor Jim Beverly in, in Canada was writing a, a glowing thing for me to try and get me a PhD somewhere. And he said that he thought that, that my book, Let's Sell These People a Piece of Blue Sky, was you know, beyond what you needed for a doctorate. The research was so deep. But he did feel that it needed more reference notes. Right. And so I counted them. And there are 1,117 reference notes. And if they want to check my honesty, they can go and check those reference notes, about half of which are to the work of Ron Hubbard, you know, who wow. is a very, very nasty piece of work. And, mm. uh, you know, when he says the law can be used very easily to harass, that is actually him saying that, not me. And when he claimed to you know, studied with gurus in the East and been a nuclear physicist who saw it was the first returned casualty of World War II in the American military and was wounded and managed to cure his wounds by creating technology. None of these things is actually true. Hmm. None of them is hmm. even vaguely true. He didn't study with gurus in the East. He had two holidays in China when he was a teenager. The only <laughs> We have the diaries. They actually 
put the diaries into a court case and I managed to get my hands on them. And this is how he describes every day that he was away in the East studying the gurus. And the closest he got was he went to a lamasery and he said that the, the voices of the monks sounded like bullfrogs. And that's it. That's the complete study of the gurus of the East. You know? We should say, um, for, for those not familiar, that Elwyn Hubbard was the founder back in, what, the 1950s, I want to say, of Scientology? He, he created Dianetics in 1950, lost that, and so created Scientology in 1952, and then mm. got Dianetics back. You mean there are people out there who've not heard of Ron Hubbard? What a thought. <laughs> I think He'd there be must very be. very disappointed. I bet, I bet there are a lot. I bet. I mean, everybody knows of Scientology, of course. I've, I've seen enough documentaries over the years. But you know when you watch, if, if it's not like your thing, uh, so Scientology is not my thing. It's one of many things I'm interested in, but I don't know that much about it, which is why I'm so interested and delighted to have you on. Uh, but you know, you watch a documentary and something like that, and you're fascinated. And the next day, someone says, "So what? What actually happened?" And you've, it's all gone. It's all out of my mind. So I don't remember any of it. But I have a vague recollection. That L. One Hubbard is has all, did he set like a record for the amount of fiction books? He's a fiction writer. Is that right? His record is is as the most prolific author, and that's not based upon his fiction. It's based upon his complete right. output. He's in the Guinness Book of World Records. I would question that because most of Hubbard's books were actually compilations made by other people. Oh. So, and, you know, he'll have, they'll have added in all of the printed versions of his lectures. So I'm not sure that that's true. He was prolific. He did write a great deal. In fact, he probably suffered from hypographia, uh, the inability to stop writing. Huh. Um, and that is actually consistent with the diagnosis of temporal lobe epilepsy. Wow. Um, it's one of the 18 points on the Bear for Dio list. And he suffered from at least 17 of those 18 criteria. And so, you know, Scientology is the outpouring of, of somebody who has a, a psychiatric condition and wow. is... You know, which will lead you towards uh, transcendent religious experiences, for example. You, you know, you get very high and believe yourself to be uh, inspired by God. That, that's wow. quite common in the condition. Um, right. So, yeah, hypographia, yes, world's most prolific author. They haven't sent me the list yet. I imagine mm. I could chop about half of it off as stuff that was republished under different titles. Or, you know, I, I interviewed the guy who edited his work from 1954 to 1978. And um, he just would get little scraps of notes or little things recorded and he would turn that into a book or some ah. sort of edition of some kind. Just loved books, that guy. And a lot of us struggle just to get one book away, you know, and he's, you know, getting hundreds of them, co like compilations that aren't even his. Have you seen mm. um, the movie The Master? I saw that again recently. With, um, have you seen that? Philip Seymour Hoffman? And uh, Joaquin Phoenix. Yeah, um, two of the great actors of the generation, and I, I was consulted while they were making it, oh. and it, along with several other things that have been done, and they just they were doing script rewrites on a daily basis to basically try and ensure that they weren't sued by Scientology. Ah, and so while it it's an interesting statement, it has almost no relationship to the original idea, which was definitely about Alan Hubbard. That's interesting because I heard them say, I've heard, I think the director, it was Paul Thomas Anderson, wasn't it? So I think I heard him say, or Joaquin Phoenix or someone, uh, this isn't about Scientology, this is just about a cult. But it's just so obviously Scientology, although obviously, as you're saying, not enough uh, to prove in a court of law. Good film though. Do you think he was, um, do you think it was a good portrayal of Someone similar to Elwyn Hubbard that Philip Seymour Hoffman did. Um, no, I don't. I don't think the character becomes Hubbard, and and I, mm. I admire Seymour Hoffman tremendously. I think he's a, an, an incredible virtuoso actor. Mm. So he, they gradually moved the character away, and I, I don't think it represents Hubbard well. No. Mm. What was Hubbard like? Doesn't pick his nose often enough. <laughs> it, it it depends who you're talking to. The, the people who were locked in with him. Uh, some of them to this day possibly have Stockholm Syndrome. Um, mm. He was indifferent to other human beings. He was cruel. He was sadistic. So, for example, mm. when he finally got to sea because he'd been thrown out of the UK and he was on trial in France and lots of people were after him, 
So he had a little flotilla of ships. He had a cattle ferry that uh, he renamed the Apollo. And among the punishments that he dished out once he got tyrannical control of everyone was if you were, say, you were two minutes late for a, a training session, you'd be thrown overboard. And hmm. just what, to get what, some idea of that, it'd be really, uh, yeah, in into what? the Mediterranean with you. To, to, um, to die, or could you get back? No, up? no, they, no, no, don't be silly. They, oh. they'd, uh, if you couldn't swim, they'd tie a rope around your ankles and pull you back up. You might be blindfolded too. Oh. Um, there'd be a rope so you could get back out. But you were hurled from, this is higher than the high diving board at swimming baths. And so mm. many people who are not swimmers, <sighs> elderly people, were thrown in. And it, so you had this really vicious um, approach. The, the worst thing that he did on the ship was there was a four and a half year old child who kept crying. He had the child put in the chain locker. You know, the chain locker is about four feet high. It's full of bilge water. There are rats in there. It's absolutely pitch black. And it's normally where the chain is when you're, you're not at anchor. Uh, so it's filthy and greasy and horrible. And he put a four and a half year old child in there to mend its ways. Mm. So th- this is the kind of this is the kind of man we're dealing with. He's uh, Cruel, tyrannical, wow. obsessed with his own rectitude, as I think most malignant narcissists are, and desperately ill most of the time, you know, right. with all sorts of drug and alcohol problems. How did somebody in that, in that position, how did he convince, how did he start a religion and convince people to join him? Well, how did Stalin become dictator of the Soviet Union? He, an alcoholic sadist, you know, I mean... How is it that Bolsonaro, Duterte, Abe, Modi, Scott Morrison, Boris Johnson, how do these people, why do we do this? The the question is so much broader. And when you look at the founders of um, belief systems, I'm not going to call them, dignify them by calling them new religious movements, as the Mm. sociologists want us to do, because I don't know what those words mean. Mm. Um, But belief systems, people who create belief systems are often relatively strange. Um, sometimes they they do good occasionally, uh, but for the most part they they don't. They probably score highly on the on the sort of psychopath checklist. A, a few of them. Yeah, I mean, I mean it's very much that they seem to be malignant narcissists, particularly, which means that they'll score between four and thirty on Hare's psychopathy checklist. Psychopaths, what he's now calling psychopaths, have changed his mind. Score oh. from thirty to forty, and. It, it's more the, there are slight differences in the behaviours. So psychopaths, for example, have no fear mm. and they will take outrageous risks. Malignant narcissists are often very cowardly and will make oh. other people take risks. Um, like, I don't think Elrond Hubbard was thrown overboard at any point or put in the chain locker, but yeah. he didn't mind doing it to other people. Was that a joke before about picking his nose? Yes, it was. <laughs> Actually, it's a referred joke. Annie Riefenstahl said that when she edited Triumph of the Will, it took six oh. months because Hitler kept picking his nose. <laughs> but no, that uh, was unfair of me to, to suggest that Aaron Hubbard ever picked his nose, and I apologise no, for that. Do not besmirch his image. He did have rotten teeth. <laughs> did he? He did have rotten teeth. Yeah. Ah. He wouldn't see a dentist. He was terrified of dentists. And so his teeth <laughs> rotted in his head. There was a guy called Cyril Vosper who was involved for 14 years, then wrote a wonderful book called The Mindbenders, in 1968. And he said he'd be approached on Tottenham Court Road in London by recruiters for Scientology. And he'd say, oh, I knew Hubbard. And they'd be in awe of him at this point. And they'd say, what do you remember about him? You know, what's the thing that's uppermost in your mind about him? He'd say, the stink that all around him, because (laughs) his teeth were rotting, he stank. Wow. Okay, that's an inside bit of information I'd never knew about. The creator of science, or they're not going to like that. Yeah, well, they've, they've actually spent quite a lot of money going back through all the photographs of him and whitening his teeth. They haven't. I was talking to Mike Rinder, who was involved with the project just a couple of yeah. weeks ago. Oh, my God, that's insane. Oh, yes. Oh, that's yes. so funny. Um, I was going to ask, so so I've had people on here, guests and stuff, uh, former Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, Westboro Baptists, People who've Ooh. left those, yeah, they're, they're they're an exciting one, aren't they? The Westboro Baptists, aren't they uh, interesting? Westboro Baptists, yeah, they they are good. Is is what is is Scientology very different to those? And and also, it's not a form of Christianity, is it? Or does it draw on Christianity? 
No, Hubbard used the word church to describe it so that he could recruit Christians. Mm. And there's a, a kind of an issue leaked on it. He, he founded the Church of Scientology, the Church of Human Engineering, mm. which is a bit scary, and the Church of American Science. And he founded them all in Camden, New Jersey in December 1953. Um, I have copies of the registrations with his signature on, because he always claimed it wasn't him that started any church. You know, he didn't want to get mm-hmm. called for that. But the Church of American Science, he may have been, you know, somebody will put me right on this, but he may have been the first person to use the word church in a non-Christian sense. I was going to say church Church is the word that makes you think Christian, because obviously Judaism, you'd say synagogue. In Islam, you'd say a mosque. Uh, so church made me instantly think, is it, it can't be Christianity, is it? Mm. Well, the Church of American Science, which he never really floated, but he, he said that its purpose was to recruit Christians and move them on to something better, like Scientology. <laughs> and wow. it, it is not, it is, you know, despite their claims to be eclectic, it's absolutely incompatible with Christianity um, be, because you have reincarnation as a fundamental doctrine, for example. And there, is, there are no teachings about God. Okay. Uh, other than when you get to the very top level, you find the claim that Hubbard himself is God, you know, but um, we're not ah. meant to say anything about that because it's a secret. So so is, this is a system, it's like a sort of uh, PlayStation game and you enter in Scientology and you give some money. This is how I'm imagining. And the, the higher up you get, the more secrets to the equivalent of the Bible that you get. You cross over from material that you're allowed to talk about, to material that you absolutely may not talk about. The, the, the purpose of the original thing, Dianetics, was to make a clear. And a, a clear would be a person who'd got rid of their reactive mind. And that's where all the bad stuff is that makes you do things that you don't know about it. Mm. it rather like kind of Mr. Hyde, you know, the, the idea mm-hmm. that we divided into Jekyll and Hyde, which I'm afraid, you know, psychologists have perpetuated since Freud, the idea mm. that there is an unconscious mind which is in fact not true. There are unconscious processes, but there isn't a single agent that's conspiring against you in your head. Hmm. Um, Scientology has that idea. You have a reactive mind. And the idea was that by going in 1950, he announced that, that he'd worked on 272 people and he brought them to this state where they were no longer irrational. They had full memory, uh, soaring IQ, 50 points um, extra IQ. Um, and they would not catch the common cold. Um, they'd not get the 70% of um, psychosomatic conditions that make up most of their illnesses. They'd be able to throw their glasses away. They wouldn't have asthma. In fact, there's a whole list of things in 1950 that it's going to cure, all of which Hubbard suffered till the end of his life. Hmm. So you know, he was short-sighted. He had asthma. Um, Interesting. Just unfortunate. But he then, in 1952, by accident, he, he managed to bankrupt the five foundations he, that he'd created. Um, he sold 150,000 copies of his first book, um, which was a surprise because it was with a medical publisher. And then the New Jersey Medical Association filed a case against him for practicing medicine without a license. And... All five of the foundations went bankrupt, basically because he put his hand into the till and taken a huge amount of money out. And so he, there was a guy trying to protect him, a guy called Don Purcell, who was an oil millionaire in uh, Wichita, Kansas. And so he said, look, I'll buy all of Dianetics from you and I'll take on the court cases. You need to be working on, you know, the new stuff and I'll do that. So for one dollar, he bought it all. The New Jersey Medical Association dropped their suit. In bankruptcy, the judge said, oh, you can buy everything for $800. And Hubbard found he didn't have any of Dianetics anymore. So he had to create this new thing. But he took these techniques and he started now talking about past lives. So rather than you know having the bad experience of birth to live through, you've got the last, well, ultimately um, 76 trillion years to, to go through. It's, it's been a long time. Mm. And and all of this science fiction st- sort of stuff starts coming in. And then he starts making it confidential that you mustn't tell anybody that 75 years ago, 75 million years ago, 
the inhabitants of the planets around this planet, which was then called Tigiak, were all rounded up, brought here and blown up in volcanoes with hydrogen bombs. And their spirits, their thetans, they themselves mm. gathered on electronic ribbons and clustered with 36 days of implanting in a cinema, um, basically of images that come from 1966, because <laughs> that's when, when he wrote it. Right. And, it's like um, ghosts, like ghosts all come from the Victorian age. We, yeah, we certainly do with, with spiritualism in the 19th century. There came a whole different view of mm -hmm. um, you know, who we are and what we are. And that, yeah, there are a few, few groups back there Madame Blavatsky with Theosophy, um, Mary Baker, Eddy um, with Christian Science. These ideas have permeated our culture. Without Madame Blavatsky, there probably wouldn't be any Aryan race theory because that's where it comes from. And the Nazis mm. picked it up from there. And modern white supremacists have got their own versions, all based on this plagiarized nonsense written by Madame Blavatsky in the 1870s, mm. which said basically that the Aryans were these people who lived in Atlantis and had superpowers. And then they miscegenated. They mixed with the people of Lemuria and they lost their electron power. Right. Which was electrons were very popular at the beginning of the 20th century. So it was electron power. It'd be laser power now, I should think. You know, but, right. Um, right. So, so and that, this, all, all of this sort of yeah, pseudo science from the uh, 19th century and onwards has you know, affected Hitler and the Nazis and then in a, later got in the head of Elwin Hubbard. Hmm. And indeed, of many of the New Age groups that, that hmm. you know, have picked up ideas. I mean, if you look at um, Mary Baker Eddy and this idea that um, everything is to do with your will, you've made what's happening to you happen. It's a mm. sort of modern take on karma. And right. that becomes the secret. It becomes the law of attraction. Uh, it's found in Scientology with the idea of postulates that you, you wish things and right. everything is to do with your spiritual state. It's found its way into contemporary forms of Christianity, prosperity Christianity, identity Christianity, where, you know, everything that happens to you is your fault, basically. Mm, I hope you unless, you give, unless you give more money. But, well, I mean, even if you what... give more money, because it will go wrong. And when it goes wrong, it'll be, well, you gave us the money and we did the stuff, but you didn't do it properly. Right, right. It reminds me of uh, Glenn Hoddle, the, the England football or soccer for Americans manager, because he was saying some stuff, wasn't he, about uh, people in their past lives and that's responsible for who you are now. I don't know if he still believes that now. Yeah. Do you remember it, that? It's a, I, I don't. I, and, and it, he was fired. He got fired as, as England manager uh, in the, I suppose, at the end of the 90s because he was picked up by a journalist as, as saying that he believes disabled people are as such because of what they've done in past lives. Oh, dear. Yeah. Yeah, so it, it's such <laughs> nonsense. Um, We've sort of, you know, talked about how it's all a lot of nonsense, right? Uh, Scientology and everything that preceded it, mystical stuff, spiritual stuff. What was it that led you as a 19-year-old into the, the clutches of Scientology? A bad breakup, the girl I'd been living with. I went mm. off, I was in a band, I was... I was a drummer, still am a drummer. And uh, this band went off to Toulouse. And when I got back six weeks later, uh, even thinner than I had been when I started out because we'd been scammed and the guitar player didn't actually have any gigs. And so I got stranded there. So I got back a little emaciated and my girlfriend had disappeared from the face of the earth. And um, it took me four days to find her. And a bit longer to find out that she was actually shacking up with one of our friends. Shit. <laughs> and um, it, I, I just went through the things you go through when you're 19 and don't know any better. Yeah. And I, I did. I, I talked with a, I, I'd known a, a woman as a psychiatrist uh, from my teens. So I rang her up and said, what do you do? What do I do? You know, I'm not feeling very good. And she said, you're over 18 and I can't talk to you. Because she, she was a child psychiatrist, was was she? Yeah, and I wasn't. You know, I was never her patient. I wasn't really asking for to become her patient, but but she mm. felt she oughtn't to give me any advice. Yeah. There's nothing like um, heartbreak at about eighteen, nineteen years old. I think there is nothing that can. I, I'm not sure any. I mean, people will say other things. I'm sure that are very heartbreaking, but it's a very particular kind of of pain that 
is is really something. So I I wouldn't belittle that as a cause of what 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 led to oh, the next no. thing for you. Hmm. And and I think it, it's a period when um, during adolescence your uh, your ability to become infatuated to to fall in love that's one of the things that comes with adolescence and so that first those first experiences are, are you, you're very vulnerable um I, I talked with my my gp i talked with an anglican priest um when i heard about scientology and read about scientology i, I went and checked with the doctor and and a priest neither of them knew anything about it which is kind of weird as it was all over the front pages <laughs> three years mm. before in the UK because the government report had absolutely condemned it, Foster Report, which is largely just Hubbard's own material printed up into a little booklet to show you what he said um, right. ab- about destroying enemies and uh, this sort of stuff. But they'd never heard of it. And I understand perhaps with the doctor that, that they're busy people, but the priest, the Anglican priest, he could have made a phone call and got back to me. Mm. But he didn't. And that would have, you know, so as far as I knew, they were absolutely fine. I went along, they were really friendly. They were, like me, they were sort of hippies. A couple of years older than me, they'd uh, finished university. They'd actually been at Bournemouth Polytechnic, all the staff at Birmingham. They're lovely people. And I bought into it as a psychotherapy. I, I didn't know about the past lives and all of this stuff. And as a psychotherapy, it looked relatively sensible. Uh, it isn't. Right. <laughs> um, and yeah, I spent nine years. I, I'm in a really unique position, I think, um, because I never became what's called a total convert. I didn't live inside Scientology. I still spoke language that people could understand. Uh, in Scientology, yeah. you kind of retreat into this. Uh, Hubbard left two dictionaries, which num- count almost 1,200 pages between them. Of his, uh, he also talked about propaganda by redefinition of words and how you change somebody's mind by doing that. Because he was very aware of that, of course. There was an episode of Peep. Did you ever watch Peep Show, the British sitcom? Occasionally, yeah. There's one where Jeremy goes in, and again, they don't. I don't think they explicitly call it Scientology. They might do, but he goes in, and it's very similar to what you're saying. They don't mention a lot of the otherworldly stuff, and he just. They say, "Are you? Do you ever feel sad?" And he's like, "Well, I don't. I guess sometimes. And, well, whatever." And they keep asking these questions, and he says, "Well, I guess I could. Yeah, I guess I do need this help." And before you know it, you're in you're in the cult. So it started off as psychotherapy, and then I mean, because you were there for quite some years in the end. So so how was it? Gra- how does it gradually dawn on you? Nine years. How does it gradually dawn? On you that this was uh, 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 yeah, uh, religious stuff as, as well as psychotherapy or well, uh, pseudoscientific. I'd come from from a, a background in Zen Buddhism, so you know I already ex- accepted reincarnation, though not in the simplistic Scientology way. Mm. Um, that wasn't hard, and and if there, you know, it, it wasn't hard to think that there might have been other civilizations not on this planet. You know, that we sure. might not be the only. And so therefore, when Hubbard starts injecting the science fiction about past lives and other places. But um, I basically threw myself into it pretty much full time for a few, about six months or something till my money ran out. Then I, I lived down in East Grinstead. I worked as a decorator there. And I just found, so this is my first engagement i got involved in december 74 i left there in february 77 because i didn't want to deal with them anymore i thought scientology was a good thing but i really wasn't very impressed with the people who were running it it seemed forgive me fascistic militaristic you know mm. all of these people dressed up in uh, sailor suits and women wearing jack boots that was one of the things i noticed in marching mm. around and that they, they didn't seem they weren't like the, the place I'd come in at where everybody was very happy. That There was very serious, um, a lot of very tired people. So for two years, I went to art college instead, hmm. and uh, which was great. Recommend yeah. it as a spiritual practice. And um, then I sort of got pulled back in. You know, I hadn't left, but uh, this very charismatic man called Ira Chaleth, who is now famous for his intelligent disobedience and courageous fellowship, and should be brilliant man. But mm. he, at that time, was involved in Scientology, and he 
sweet talked me back in. So I moved back down to East Grinstead and I did what Hubbard, after he got his psychotherapy and his idea clear together, he then said, well, right, um, you need to be able to operate outside of your body. The wow. optimum state for a Thetan, a spiritual being, is three feet back of the head. I'm not really sure why that's the place you should be, but that's what you reckon. And so this whole bridge, all of these steps, 28 of them by my count, get into place so that you will ascend to the godly powers lost to the Aryans, the godly powers that apparently we all have within us. Mm. And I did all of that. I Well, most of it, um, 25 out of then 27 levels. And I wasn't impressed. The earlier stuff had seemed interesting. What I was being taught seemed interesting. But being told that I was infested with hundreds of thousands of little beings that had clustered mm. together inside my body and were directing my thoughts just didn't seem true to me or real. Uh, it seemed crazy. And so during the last year, I drifted away. And then there was a huge breakaway movement. More than half of the membership left when we found out that Hubbard had been running infiltration into governments and cool. his wife and 10 other people were sent to prison for uh, charges that included kidnapping, false imprisonment, breaking and entering, burglary, and wow. stealing a huge amount of American government documents. They did the same here, but the Home Office wasn't interested in prosecuting them. I gave them the names, but you know, probably they were too high up in the Home Office by then to get rid of them. So. Wow, so they really have sort of their tentacles spread in, in high places. They were busted in Canada, in France. There are allegations in Italy and Spain. And it is part of the the training that, that you take Scientology with you. It's, Hubbard specifically says, don't bother to get elected, just get a job by somebody who's been elected and influence them. So that's why mm. Germany actually bans um, Scientologists from the civil service, understanding that their first duty will be to sign. Wow. What, what are they trying to influence them to do just to get more Scientologists and more money? To adopt Scientology, um, I think there was a specific cause with Hover because by the time he died, there were more than 300 outstanding writs naming him. Mm. And so I think, I think he was probably being a little bit selfish that he wanted to have influence so that, so that he could do what the hell he liked. So what are just just nowadays, and uh, you know, people make sly jokes and things about uh, Tom Cruise, John Travolta. What is Tom Cruise doing there? Because he's got more money than anything in the world. He doesn't need any more power or anything. He's the he's the most famous man on the planet, more or less. What what's he what's what do you think is going through his mind? Not very much. Um, <laughs> he's not educated. Uh, he has dyslexia. Um, hmm. And uh, reading uh, Leah Remini's uh, wonderful book, Troubleshooter, she was a long-term member of Scientology, but she knew Cruz. And she talks about him having a, a fit when his assistant hasn't got the, the muffin mix ready for him to put in the oven. He's a child. He's an overgrown child. Wow. Um, and it works two ways. People become more and more deeply invested in their beliefs. I left Scientology in 1983 because I wanted to perpetuate Scientology. I thought there was something really good in it. And I became the center of the independent movement in, in this country. And then over a period of a few months, a horde of documents arrived about Hubbard and his past. And it became evident that he was a liar. He wasn't yeah. a nuclear physicist. He hadn't studied the gurus. He wasn't wounded in the war. He hadn't seen action in the war. And he hadn't cured himself of anything. Um, he, he was a depressive, and then that carried on right the way through Scientology. He'd lock himself away where nobody could see him. How did it feel for you to, to read that stuff? Well, it must have been quite shocking to, that your entire belief system had, had been founded on lies. What was that moment like for you emotionally? It was very difficult, but um, you know, I saw his actual college grades showing that he'd failed his course in atomic and molecular, not nuclear physics, hmm. um, which he would later admit in the lecture, which I found. Um, it, I suppose for one thing that right from the start, 
because I'd come from the Buddhist tradition, I had no idea of people being gods. So I'd always regarded Hubbard as a human being. And when he said things that were stupid, I identified them as stupid and, and said he must have been having a bad day. So I didn't have the devotion to him. Mm. And I was surprised when I found that most of the people around me did. Also, when I found out conclusively that he was a liar, which is demonstrable by conflicts in his own statements, you know, um, particularly about war wounds and that he didn't have any when he went public in 1950. But gradually, as time went by, by 1965, yeah. he got to the point where he'd been um, crippled and blinded. Um, so his own statements showed that, that he was a liar. And there's, mm. there's a fundamental principle to me in Scientology. Hubbard says the road to truth must be trod with true steps. And he says, honesty is sanity. And at that point, I was, I was done point where I realized he was a liar and then I turned around to the community around me because I said I was in the middle of the independent movement I had hundreds of people who were in touch with me and I started to tell them these things and none of them wanted to accept it I've seen you write about attacking somebody's beliefs is is like attacking their child yeah well, it, it's, it's not just their child it's their baby it, it's like saying to somebody your baby's ugly and people hang on to doctrine and we all do it the confirmation bias we have means that, that what I believe is true. And if you bring me anything that, that contradicts it, that will cause cognitive dissonance. And why didn't that affect you at that time? It must have, that's why it must have hurt in that moment of like, he's a liar. There must have been two conflicting parts of your mind. No, it, the, the, the evidence was clear. I accepted the evidence. It was mm. then a matter of, it took, that was about, I left in October 83. It was late November that I first saw this material. It took me till about May. You know, I had my last Scientology uh, auditing in the December. And during the, period, the course of that, just when I, I really don't believe in any of this anymore, uh, yeah. much to the shock of the poor woman auditing. Bloody me. Hell. But it, it, you then, I think there's a specific process and many people don't do it. I've been involved with about 600 people in recovery, largely from Scientology, but from other authoritarian groups too. And there's something in my practice that many other people who are intervening don't do. And, and that is, you have to think about what you believed and decide whether you still believe it. And for me, the only way to do that, because I'd lived inside the Scientology mindset for nine years, was to say, I don't believe any of it. I will now consider it on a piecemeal basis and I will readopt any of it that makes sense to me. And as I analysed each separate part of the dogma, I found, and it's nearly 38 years later, I found absolutely nothing that I wanted to retain because anything that was decent, I found come, had come from somewhere else and Hubbard had perverted it in some way to make it less useful. So it, it's baloney fundamentally, yeah. but it's incredibly complex baloney. Like a lot of religions, I suppose. Do you think there's any... Yeah. Any, is there any lasting legacy on you from those nine years in there? Is there, is there was, were there any really difficult parts for you? No. That, and that is where I'd say I seem to be unique. I've not met anybody else. And you know, certainly no more than a thousand people who've been involved in Scientology who did not have, who was not abused, who was not traumatized. The, the reason for that is because Hubbard has this policy about celebrities. And anybody who is a writer, artist, musician, mm. is treat actor, is treated with in a special way. So even though I wasn't earning money, <laughs> I was always treated as a celebrity. Because um, you're a writer so and it, stuff. Yeah, writer. Uh, as I say, my training is is, is an artist. I, I, yeah, I'm a musician. I do all that. Is it that possible? Kind of stuff. Is it possible in your mind? Again, you, I imagine you don't know him well. I'm, I'm just going back to Tom Cruise or whatever. Is it possible he knows it's all nonsense, but he's getting treated so nicely? Again, I'm still thinking, but he gets treated nicely wherever he goes. But a lot of nice, it's nice being treated that way. I, I think once you've accepted a, a set of beliefs, those beliefs own you. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I, I, I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it. Please. Um, I worked with the, the Christian churches in East Grinstead for a couple of years. They, they had a, an organization called Churches Together in East Grinstead. 
there had to be two separate meetings because the Baptists and the Catholic couldn't be in the same room together. Yeah. So right. it should have been called Churches Un together. But whatever, for two years I worked with these people. I sat with the, one of the Baptist ministers at one point and he said to me, do, do these people really believe that 75 million years ago this Prince Zenu blew people up in volcanoes? And I looked at him and said, unthinking, there are people who believe it was a bloke who could not only walk on water, but turn it into wine. <laughs> I bet that went down well. It's the only time I have actually seen somebody blush beetroot red. And I, <laughs> I felt so sorry that I'd, I'd you know, said this thing. But the yeah. point is that our beliefs contain us, that, that our behaviours are the result of our beliefs. Um, and the development of our conscience. For a documentary I made, I learned to perform an exorcism. So I've seen people believing that they are being exorcised by demons and and that kind of thing. And then I come home from that. That was in Argentina. I was there for you know a while working on that documentary. And then I come home and then people are saying, can you believe that so-and-so believes in Donald Trump or would vote for this person or that? And I'm like, I literally just saw a person screaming and writhing, writhing around on the floor because they think the devil's inside them. Yes, I can believe that someone might vote differently from me or you it, politically. That's nothing compared to the human mind's quite amazing. When you look at the other end of it, 45% of, of medical doctors joined the Nazi party in Germany. They, they were more highly represented than any other profession. Because eugenics was the, the sort of common belief, is that right? In the science community at the time. Yeah, sure. D.H. Uh, Lawrence and uh, George Bernard Shaw were huge supporters of eugenics. In fact, Lawrence yeah. offered to actually pull the switch if anybody wanted. What switch? Oh, to kill people. What, kill anyone who's not white? No, not not, not white. Eugenics is, is for the disabled. Um, it, 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 the, I, yeah, the I thought it was Nazi also... And, and then they, okay, the Nazis took it to, to the Aryan level. No, the, the, the Nazis, the, the, the programme against the Jews is, yes, it could be conceived of as eugenic. The eugenics programme, the T4 programme in Nazi Germany, which killed perhaps 200,000 people, was for people who were deaf, uh, who suffered spasticity, who had mental illness, epilepsy, uh, many of them murdered by their own doctors. Wow. So in terms of how crazy a belief can be, and of course this had happened elsewhere. It had happened in California with the sterilization pro program. It had happened in Sweden, in Brazil, in Japan, where they were sterilizing people. And of course it will happen again in India, under Indira Gandhi, sterilizing people for transistor radios. So, and you know, now we have ethnic cleansing as well. But eugenics per se is breeding better stock. What the Germans did, what the Nazis under the Annenerb, under Heinrich Himmler did, was they created the Lebensborn, where they were actually going to breed pure Aryans who would have superpowers, Himmler believed. Not a lot of people wow. know that. No. Well, I knew about the Ubermensch and the Untermensch uh, stuff. I mean, mm. it does. It's. I mean, it all sounds again. It's just religion, isn't it? And then the USSR. That what you, you you mentioned Stalin before. These are all just cults and religions. Just some of them seem to get in charge of governments, and others like Scientology didn't. So uh, obviously, be you know, in, in, in impacting on governments. Yeah, and and I I think the word religion has become dangerous. I mean, I made a slighting comment about the sociologists' use of new religious movement because they don't like the word cult. A cult is a group that is fixated upon a leader or a doctrine. That's what the word means. The, the word has been changed in its meaning because it was used by the media and as if it were a, a pejorative term. And you know, so sociologists, uh, led by Brian Wilson and Gordon Melton, gave us this term, new religious movement. The Beach Boys. Yeah, but it's spelt with a Y. He was oh, it's a not him. at Cambridge. <laughs> I hope okay. it's not him. You know, that would be very confusing. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed, you know. Um, <laughs> but no, he, he was a professor of sociology who um, gave us criteria for deciding whether something is a religion or not. And he actually, Scientology was at the centre of his study. And he said, well, it is a religion according to these points. When you go through the points, it's very interesting because the Manson family score higher and so do the Nazis. So they were religions. So I'd like to just scrap the word religion and. The word new in new religious movements means either from uh, Joseph Smith in 1830 with the Mormons or after the Second World War, according to Professor Eileen Barker. 
you can, what is new? You know, I mean, hmm. I think we should just talk about belief systems, whether they're political or religious. When a belief system is powerful enough that, that you will kill others in the name of it, or you will you know, not have blood transfusions like the Jehovah's Witnesses and let your children die, and one dies every day yeah. in their community somewhere in the world. Um, when you start believing absurdities, you'll be willing to commit atrocities, as Voltaire said. Yeah. And so, yeah. But I think if we just look at belief systems and, and how powerful they are, it does seem impossible to separate what are thought of as spiritual beliefs from secular beliefs. So Mao Zedong, the greatest mass murderer of all time, mm. managed to actually create a belief system in the Communist Party, um, yeah. which allowed, what, 70 million people to be slaughtered and him still to have his image in his catafalque in Tiananmen Square. What was his his catchphrase? It was something like one mile on or something like that. What was that? Yeah, something like that. One um, step, the great step, the step forward. The, the great the great leap forward. The great leap forward. The great leap forward was was the policy um, where, where they sought to get rid of the old-fashioned belief systems by killing the people who had them. It was a usual... They had the... These camps they've had in, in Xinjiang for the Uyghur with a million people in them. The re-education camp started in 1949 as soon as Mao was in power and they went on for about four years. And then they were incorporated into the university system. So if you were a student in a Chinese university, one of the things you do is you would witness the torture and killing of a landlord. Wow. It became, you know, it's part of the curriculum that you, you got to be with the people and bonded in this way. That then moves on into the Cultural Revolution, where children were, young people were killing their own parents, burying their professors alive, and this sort of thing. So Oof. it doesn't need to be religion. It's just belief. It's where you get people to yeah. believe these crazy things, which are life-denying. I don't like the word religion, because obviously it, it, makes, it makes it feel sacred and above a cult, and like you can't attack it. It's like, we don't talk about politics at the table, don't talk about religion at the table, and you can't say anything. Whereas I think cults, I guess I understand that cult also has the negative side. Neither, neither are neutral words. Uh, religion implies you can't attack, and cult implies you should do. Uh, but these are all just, I, I agree with you, belief is a much more neutral term, isn't it? And mm. I mean, with religion, it, it, it is a, an annoying idea that it's come to be viewed as positive because mm. look at, say, the thuggies in India, mm. that um, they were killing tens of thousands of people every year. And uh, the Raj in the 1830s got a little bit annoyed about this. And over the next 20 years, the thuggies were extirpated they were pulled up by the roots but they are a phenomenal group they are religious they are worshippers of kali it is their duty to strangle people and steal their money because that's mm. a religious duty and they spread thoroughly enough that they were not only hindu they actually were recruiting muslims who were joining up and doing this there were massive gangs through through God. india and it's a religion satanism is a religion yeah. um, you know whichever way you go so as a protective term, it, it, it's awful. We shouldn't, shouldn't use it. Last little question, just to go, go back to Scientology, because I've done, we've, got, we've done a lovely, beautiful hour almost. Well, yeah. Um, do, do you have any contact now with the Scientologists? I know once you wrote uh, your book, which, which was a while ago now. Let's sell these people a piece of blue sky. There's, if people want, want something a little bit simpler, yeah. um, which is this... Ooh. This is just the basic stuff for anybody. Okay. Yeah, just talk. just for those listening, most people are listening. Very thin. Only. Yeah, most yeah. people are just listening, so you should say the name of it, of the book that you're holding up to the screen. Scientology, The Cult of Greed. Yeah. Very inexpensive. So, so you've been... <laughs> everyone should buy that now. Buy it. Uh, I'll, should, do a whole, right. <laughs> I'll do a whole intro and outro as well on the audio mm -hmm. version where I'll talk about it more and where to, I'll leave links and stuff where to get it. Right. Um, but... Yeah, you got what? What picketed? Would you say, or people they kicked off at you? What was your experience with that? Because that's what they're famous for, isn't it? The Scientologists, when somebody mm. goes against them. Yeah, well, I, I had a very narrow pavement outside my house, and the police had to keep removing these six people yeah. who wandered up and down with placards, you know, um, 
look after your own of own family instead of destroying ours and yeah. uh, anti-religious hate campaign. I went, I gave a talk in Berlin, and mm. they'd got about fifty of them there. Mm. Um, but the more alarming thing was was going to the United States, and whenever I was over there, which was relatively frequent in the eighties and early nineties, being followed by people with guns because they hire private detectives who are allowed to uh, to follow you around carrying a gun. Did you fear for your life? Yes. Shit. Yeah. They don't generally is, hurt people, though, do they? Well, d- dis- describe hurt. Um, they've mm. destroyed the lives of many people. Um, mm. There was a, an Anglican priest called Neil Duddy who pretty much did my job before I came along. And he ended up walking off the side of a mountain after the News of the World had completely falsely done a double centre page on him hiring rent boys and giving them cocaine at his vicarage. His life was destroyed by Scientology. And so they they would have fed that line to the newspaper. Absolutely. Wow. Am I likely to get anything for for talking to you? No. There's a guy called Arnie Lerma who was very active against them, the late Arnie Lerma. When I asked him to write a puff for the new and unexpurgated version of Let's Sell These People a Piece of Blue Sky, he said, before the internet and safety and numbers, there was John Atak. So I actually quit this work in 96 and have come back and talked about it a bit in the broader context of authoritarianism and, you know, preventative medicine yeah. for our children. So they won't be drawn into abusive relationships and authoritarian groups. That's what I've done for the last 10 years. So there are now thousands of people openly wow. criticizing Scientology. So um, fear not. If you do get any odd letters, let me know. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I will. It would, well, I guess part of me is disappointed. Not, not obviously. I don't want a, a horrible story about me to appear in the newspaper, but um, maybe sort of some signs and things would be nice. I was scared. I've had you know people who have left extreme Islam on the show. I've had a few of them, and that I was really scared after that. But nothing at all happened. I did have to. I did have the, the family of a woman who I spoke to who had left the Hasidic Jews, uh, Hasidic mm-hmm. Jewish, you know. Uh, and I thought I'd be all right there because I'm Jewish myself, although only, only in, you know, not, not in beliefs at all. Um, and uh, they were very, quite aggressive. That was, that was the only time someone got in touch was, was quite aggressive um, in terms of take this down now. And I ended up taking the, the video version down because the, the, the actual woman who I'd interviewed, who was just the most lovely, beautiful person and so sad that, you know, she her whole life you can't speak to her family she just said you know what it would be easy if you take it down because they're just not going to back down um but yeah it was i came across you because on 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 red i don't know much about the scientology world and i thought oh i'd like to talk to someone uh, about scientology and i put into reddit and i said who would be good to talk to from scientology and a lot of people came back with your name and then there was also i think it was was it chris chris shelton Shelton. chris shelton Shelton. was the other was the other one so he's going to come on in a couple of weeks, I'm doing a couple of Great. Scientology. Yeah, do you, do you know you know very, him? Very good friend of mine. I've done, I think, 21 yeah. shows with him so far. Oh, wow. But, okay, yeah. well, great. It was a good good couple of people. I tried as well. I thought I might as well do the trio. I tried uh, Leah. Is it Leah or mm. Leah? Leah Remini. Leah Remini, I think. Le- Leah Remini. Tried, I didn't get a reply from, from her. But that. Um, totally Mike been. Rinder, who works with her, you might get. And Mike was 20 years, the guy running the harassment division so and he worked with Hubbard and and he's very smart and he's I have this thing about the weaponized empath that that one of the problems of these groups is that they recruit empaths who really want to help the world and then they weaponize them they you know these people yeah, are then yeah, turned yeah. to doing awful things in the belief um that you know it's a necessity yeah to to, to do these things for the you know, we have to get rid of the vermin, or the people we don't like, so yes. that we can have a triumphant Aryan civilization or, or what have you. The problem is it's so hard to know until 50 years later whether one person was being led astray or not. And you have to, there are so many, for example, the culture wars going on right now, and there's so much stuff. And right now, J.K. Rowling is trending again 
Um, and obviously she, in her camp, she would say, oh, I'm just fighting for feminism and why not? And on the other camp, you'd say, I'm just fighting for trans rights. So we're both doing good things. And yet they're clashing so dramatically. And it's like from, from afar, because I don't really, I don't have any, whatever the expression is in that fight, dog in that fight. So I'm just watching it like, oh my God, this is, I don't know who's right about this. And maybe in 50 years, we might know. I mean, how do you know at the time? I, I think with anything you assess the information you have, you you look to, to see what authorities you believe. And in that particular instance, I can see arguments on both sides. Um, mm. My colleague Steve Hassan is very concerned that people are being talked into gender change too young. Mm. And he is dealing with people who've changed their minds. Mm. And that's got to be a horrible thing. So um, we, we had it. There was a case in in the UK last last year, I think it was, where um, somebody who had gone through a transition at the age of sixteen or seventeen successfully sued the clinic. Oh wow! Uh, for having persuaded them to do this, and and it, so I see that 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 specific point. I don't think J.K. Rowling is against transgender in any way, but I think the the concern is that people are too young when the transition yeah. is being made. Well, I think her her issue as well was that that women are being eradicated because you can't say I'm a woman and and they're changing some you know uh, you can't say in in adverts for uh, things related to periods they they now say people who have periods rather than women because there are people identifying as men who haven't transitioned yet and and it's just it's very complex of course I I commented on one of her tweets yesterday and I just said. If you'd like to come on the podcast, because obviously it would be nice to get J.K. Rowling on the podcast. Yes. And yes. I just got within minutes, I just got like lots of men. I don't know, it was just men going berserk at me, just going, oh, right, you want a platform of transphobe, do you? So why don't you? And I was like, I, d- I just, I like Harry Potter. And I like, <laughs> she's obviously a very in- interesting person. And I was just trying to reason with these people. And I thought, you know what? Mm-hmm. What am I even? Because everything I said, they, and they did what you said at the beginning of what did you call it? An ad hominem. Ad hominem. Attack the person rather than the information. They all start going. Well, a privileged white man like you, something, something. And I was like, what do you? I mean, it is probably true, but what do you know? I could be anything. You don't know any of this. For all you, you know, but they, they're all just doing that. It's just crazy how qu- quickly people go to that. And, and there you, you have what happens with belief systems that that people come to believe things. Um, I have presentations on my YouTube channel um, made by Yuval Laor, who is at the leading edge in terms of seeing how our evolutionary tendencies fit in with the way that awe and fervor can be induced in us. It's got nothing to, you know, most of the people in the counter-cult field say critical thinking. You've got to teach people critical thinking. My critical thinking was fine when I got in Scientology. I knew what a Socratic argument was. And it didn't save me because it's an emotional connection we make that, that when we've, we've, we suddenly believe something, then we will hold on to it like crazy. And to, to get evidence through that, well, you know, that, that's what I, I spent the first seven years after I got out of Scientology working out how to talk to somebody who fanatically believed. And I got there. And then I've spent the last 30 years trying to persuade governments to take you know de-radicalizing you know it, it it's not it's the same process when you've got somebody who believes something fanatically there is a way in a single conversation of getting them to reconsider their views and with Scientologists I was able to do that on a one for one basis that anybody who talked to me would rethink what what they were doing and instead you get people who want to argue with them they want to try and reason them out You've got to find out how they've become emotionally attached. It's interesting because we had we had uh, David Robson. I say we. It's just it's just me. As if I got this big operation with the studio, the fake studio behind me. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah, I had a uh, David Robson on, who's a is, uh, mm. a writer who who did the book called The Intelligence New Scientist. Trap. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. So yeah. so and he, I've he, read he, The Intelligence Trap. It's a very good book. 
Oh, fantastic! Nick. Yeah, well, he was he was brilliant, uh, just as you are, just as everyone who comes on this Thank podcast you. is. <laughs> and he we only invite brilliant people. <laughs> only brilliant people, except one, but I won't tell you who that was. No, everyone was brilliant. Mm. And David, yeah, and exactly the intelligence trap. So that Arthur Conan Doyle believed in fairies and obviously had an emotional attachment to that belief. Yeah, and it, and it, it's bizarre that that the man who you know is the paragon of <laughs> intellectual intellection. Creates Sherlock Holmes. Critical thinking. Yet when he's presented with what is very obviously a photograph of two little fairies cut out of a book stuck <laughs> into a plant, and you can see it, you can see the outlines of the cutouts, he said, there, this, this proves it, there are fairies. And then, of oh. course, tried to prove to Houdini that his mum was being channeled by Conan Doyle's wife. And Houdini, who really wanted to talk to his dead mother, said, just like to point two things out. You've drawn a crucifix on the top of the page. My mum was Jewish and it's in English. My mum never spoke a word of English. <laughs> and that led Houdini to be the Derren Brown of his day. You know? I, lo I, lo I love the idea of, of like ghosts speaking different languages and like what language does a ghost speak? But also, uh, I think, that, what was the other one? That it was her birthday, I believe, and, and that she, there was no, she made no reference of it mm. or something like that. Yeah, but it shows that even, you know, and Conan Doyle, of course, was, was trained as a medical doctor. Um, and his idol was his professor, who be, who really is the Sherlock Holmes character, but that he was so smart and so gullible. That critical thinking stuff, I think that's a really good point, what you're saying, because I hear that all the time from people who are on totally different sides of this political spectrum saying, we have to teach critical thinking so that people... And it's like, what you want people to t teach your critical thinking and you want people to teach your critical thinking. Like, who critical thinking... For, the J.K. Rowling thing, for example, you could probably find a thousand very well-written, beautifully put arguments on both sides and your critical thinking... Like you say, your emotions will move towards one or the other, I suppose. And I think also that somebody who said that there are only five possible philosophers in the world, and they're the five basic Greek philosophers. Um, so you have the Platonic, the Aristotelian, the Cynic, uh, the Stoic, mm. and the Epicurean. Those are the five ways of looking at the world. And myself, I'm an Epicurean Stoic. You know, mm. I wouldn't want to be a miserable Stoic. I don't know what Epicurean... What does Epicurean mean? It sounds like a haircut. Uh, Epicurean means liking the good stuff in life, enjoying yourself. <laughs> and Epicure is the word we have from it. But Epicurus was a philosopher. Right, um, right. And, uh, you know, I personally think that, that that comes out of regarding all of humanity as one family and having com trying to have compassion towards all of humanity. The problem is that people will fit, you know, say they are platonic. So they will then believe in the philosopher kings, the idea that, that there is an upper, an aristocracy of the intelligentsia who should rule the world. Um, mm. And they will then fit everything into that way of looking at things because they consider themselves to be part of the intelligentsia, inevitably, and mm. part of the elite. Um, you'll have people who are cynical. They, they will just negate everything. They're what Eric Fromm called life-denying. Um, and... People are stoic yeah. and are kind of, oh, well, you can't really expect too much, can you? I think that's me. <laughs> yeah, that's probably you. And they, they <laughs> you know, things will fit to that. And if it doesn't fit in that ballywick, then it, it won't, you know, it simply won't be taken on board. Yeah. And critical thinking won't get you there because we aren't objective. Mm. Go figure. We are subjective. That's, that's going to be the reality of it. Doesn't mean we can't be objective, but most people, most of us, will fit everything to our own values, and they can be values from school, from childhood. They can be things we don't question. When I was a little boy, I was told I got to love everybody because that's what our hero Jesus did. And it took me until my thirties to finally sit down and go, "Is that true? Should I do that?" And I decided I didn't want to anymore. And uh, I, I would go with the uh, the medical one of first do no harm, that, that I won't hurt people deliberately. But I no longer feel obliged to take in every homeless person and drunk and, you know, mm. look after them. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> certain ideas are, are written into us and, and we need to be able to challenge our unquestioned assumptions and 
part of so much of that is emotion, critical emoting. Uh, so yeah, on uh, Yuval Law, or, or fervor and belief on my channel, recommend it to everybody. It also changes our view of evolution, the old kind of Mendel Dawkins selfish gene stuff. It's gone. Modern biologists are really not working you know, with the idea of modularism, that Yuval Harari thing in Sapiens, that we've got these modules and it, it prevents us from free will. It, we can't really do anything because we're just acting out this stuff that happened to send. No, genes aren't read only. We have epigenetics and we have um, symbolic evolution because we have language. We're mm. human beings. We can change stuff in a moment, mm. but our own genes are changing. You know, they right. aren't being passed on from the beginning of time. They're changing at every iteration and being written on by our behavior. So if you eat far too many hamburgers and supersize yourself, then your grandchild can, be, can become obese. There's wow. a little piece of epigenetics for you. So, which <laughs> yeah. means that we are causal agents, which means we aren't the victims of karma or evolution. But what we do actually matters and what everybody does really matters, I believe.